Welcome, welcome, welcome. Yes, coming off our summer hiatus, we are ready to rubble. Let's huh? get ready to rubble! <laughs> Ow. I'm Rob Walter. And I'm Matt Gotthold. And we are the Podcast Pediatricians. As always, we are on iTunes, Google Play, and Stitcher. And remember to check out our website, podcastpediatricians.com, and sign up on our email for special features and extras. Give us some feedback and make suggestions for future shows. We had fun at Hop Topics and Pediatrics at Disney World in late July and have many things to talk about today. Many things. And we did have a lot of fun, although one of us went to the parks and one of us did not go to <laughs> any of the parks. And if you went to Animal Kingdom, you would have met one of our mentors, a true physician role model that walks around the animal kingdom you know what i'm talking about no dr mcstuffins yeah <laughs> do, do, do you know who dr mcstuffins is well apparently that's the name that's invoked constantly when my when parents come in and say like he's just like dr mcstuffins <laughs> <laughs> you, and i've seen a picture of jo- dr mcstuffins and i don't think i'm much like dr I, mcstuffins I, I, you I don't, know? i'm I a don't, little taller i think i have different decals of dr mcstuffins on like all the walls in my office, so I'm sitting ne- standing next to her, mm-hmm. and I took pictures with my son, and I and I I, I turned to her and I said, "Hey, do you take Medicaid?" <laughs> <laughs> And her expression changed, although it's fixed because she's yes, a well, you cartoon tell character. But I inside. could tell on the inside mm-hmm. that she shrunk a little bit on the inside. She didn't uh, answer me at all, but uh, ah. I'll put... Uh, she's a bit elitist. A Maybe she's bit. a concierge. A little bit. Yeah, um, that's but not right. I'll put, <laughs> I'll put her picture and me up on the website. Nice. Anyway, we really enjoyed it. One of the more fun parts of it was the hot controversies we did. Should kids play tackle football? Had a debate on that. Yeah, that was and, juicy. And do we really need to to screen no-risk 11-year-olds for high cholesterol, and we will be covering that in the subsequent episodes, not this one yet. So yeah, there's good stuff there. So how was the rest of your summer, Matt? Great. You know, this, this was really the best summer I've had in a long time, mainly because I got to spend a little bit more time with my kids who are getting older, and uh, and we managed to make it for the first time, you know, by hook or by crook, over to, uh, to the European continent. So that was my summer. That was the highlight. How about you? Did you, did you do anything? Uh, actually, I went with my kids to Europe, too, but the part of Europe that most people don't go to, we went to Helsinki and Ooh. to Estonia. Oh, wow. And you ask me Can why. Can I find that on a map? I think I'm, so. I'm not sure yeah. you could, Matt, <laughs> with your South Jersey education. Is, that, but is it anywhere near Poughkeepsie? I, no. Um, <laughs> what's that joke about Poughkeepsie? The armpit of the nation. You can't see the end of the world, but you, no, it's not the end of the earth, the world, but it's you can see it from there. Something, <laughs> Something like, that. like that. So I don't know why we went these places, and my son picked it out, but it was cool. Hels- Helsinki was cool. Estonia is kind of a hidden gem, capital city of Tallinn, the Western Islands. And when we were in Estonia, we saw in their beautiful opera house a performance of Fiddler on the Roof in Estonian with English subtitles. Wow. And now, Estonian's a really weird language. It's related to Hungarian, Magyar, and the Finnish, so it's unlike any other European language. And hardly anybody outside those countries can understand it, including me. <laughs> but if there's one musical that I could mm-hmm. see that I don't have to know anything what they're saying and, <laughs> and know every single lyric, it's Fiddler on the Roof. And it was kind of cool seeing it in Estonia because... In Fiddler on the Roof, the bad guys are the Russians in the Pale of Settlement in Imperial Russia in 1905, which were persecuting and killing Jews with pogroms. And when I was little, I wondered when I watched it why they had Russians and not Nazis. I was a bit ignorant about time and places back then. But in Estonia, the Russians kind of were the Nazis. And in fact, when I went to some of the history museums, it's clear that in World War II, they actually greeted the Nazis as liberators because they hated the Russians so much. Wow. Yeah. So, I mean, speaking of being ignorant of a topic, you know, when I was not at all clued into the pogrom or the whole, you know, uh, uh, concept of what had happened to the Jews in Russia. So, so I had to look it up, of course. So pogrom is a Russian word, which when directly translated means to wreak havoc. So pogroms typically describe violence by Russian authorities against Jewish people, especially officially mandated things like the slaughter of people. I mean, the wanton slaughter of innocents. Though the word has been extended to the massacres of other groups as well. As a result of widespread, long-term anti-Semitism, you know, Jewish people really became a scapegoat, you know, as they have largely in other parts of the world for the misfortunes of others. So, you know, if something went wrong... Geez, it's 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 blaming the local Jewish population, and that's how it was, you know, unfortunately in Russia as well. And same thing with Roma, the Gypsies. Same mm-hmm. thing in Myanmar now. True. With the absolutely Rohingya. Mm-hmm. Is that? 
Yeah. But uh, and we both love history, and it's fun to go to a country and delve into it that you don't really know. And we took these free walking guides. Have you done that in new cities? It's, Not, they're really no, kind of fun. They're usually done mm-hmm. by millennials, like twenty something. So on the walking tour. We were the only Americans, which is also kind of fun. I asked the woman who had bright pink hair. It was very, uh, she was great. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I asked her, so what happened to the Estonian Jews in her country in World War II? And basically, it sounds like the Russians sent most of them si- to Siberia to die, and some survived. And then the Nazis came in and just shot the rest. It didn't bother with a concentration camp or anything, just shot them all. But there is a synagogue now in Estonia and reportedly a JCC. So. Mm-hmm. There's that. Yeah, I mean, that kind of turmoil. I, you Well, you know this because you're reading the same book I am for our book club, but we're reading a book called Midnight's Children by Salman Rushdie. And already, just within the first 100 pages or so, it's clear that at least I was pretty ignorant of the type of um, tension that existed and still exists in, in India between Hindus and Muslims. And um, this just seems to be you know, a cancer of humanity. We can't tolerate each other. And you know? yeah, I had no idea about the violence of... Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The partition yeah. in 1947, right? You know, after World War II, it, no idea mm-hmm. the depth of it, but it's a long book. Oh yeah, <laughs> it's a really long uh, book. Well, uh, <laughs> don't tell the other two guys, but I have it on audio book. Oh, okay, <laughs> I, that'd be a long audio book. That would be like 22 hours, baby. Wow, uh, <laughs> I'm four hours into it. <laughs> I can't, I can't do that. So Estonia, what do you know about Estonia? Do you realize that you were watching one of the most famous Estonians last week? Mm, I nope. 100% you were. The gentleman named Margus Hunt. You recognize that? The defensive tackle for the Indy Colts, Ooh. who almost single-handedly ruined the return of, <gasps> wait for it, Ooh. Carson Wentz. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, and and take a visual of this. Rob and I are about to watch an Eagles game and when we're done with this. He's got his Carson Wentz t-shirt on. Yeah, and I've I'm got sporting my, it with pride. I've got my light-up cup that will nice. light up uh, when the <laughs> yeah, Eagles... Yeah, we'll see if that works. <laughs> ...score a touchdown. No, we are so excited to have the Eagles back in the, in our lives. Not to belabor the point, because you know those of you who aren't from Philly probably don't appreciate this as much, but... Uh, Boy, you know, it, it is such a celebratory atmosphere at the link these days after a Super Bowl victory. Absolutely. And by our long beleaguered and much appreciated now Philadelphia Eagles. Next week, when we talk about should kids play tackle football, you can see how much of hypocrites Matt and I are. <laughs> that's right. When we talk about tackle football and kids and then talk about the Eagles. So that's, that should be fun. Hypocrites and, with a capital H, I would have to say. And the, uh, the other major thing I did in August, talk about families, I went to Florida for a family reunion for my parents' 65th anniversary. And on a football-related note, I learned at that party that my mother was a high school football cheerleader for four years at Newburgh Free Academy, and she went to four senior proms back in the day in the late 40s when only senior boys could take a date to a senior prom. That was Ooh, not what I wanted wow. to know about my mom. <laughs> what, what, what are you insinuating? <laughs> that, that your mom was a party girl? Uh, Rob, well, that, that's a little disrespectful. Well, I, I said to her, she and she just said, and, and I do believe her, that no one would ever try anything because her father, my grandfather, would kill them. And I also believe that because he used to own multiple bars in Newburgh, New York, on what they used to say was the wrong side of the track and was a bit connected and spent a couple years upstate oh, no. for running liquor. <laughs> you have which, relatives who went upstate. <laughs> I know. My coolest relative, and I never asked him about it. He used the name Johnny Acropolis all the time. <laughs> Nobody messed with Johnny Acropolis. And I thought, like, at one point I thought maybe I would use that name as a pediatrician, like, <laughs> Dr. Johnny Acropolis. What do you think? Can I pull that off? <laughs> That's like me being like, Dr. Matthew of St. Peter's Basilica. (laughs) I mean, what's up with the Acropolis stuff? Uh, (laughs) That's very interesting. I know. He he owned cigar shops later on. He was an interesting guy. So, Matt, our disclaimer. (laughs) So, as we like to remind our listeners, we're sharing our own personal opinions on pediatric care. Always talk to your own pediatric caregiver about your child. Pediatric caregivers should always consult expert guidelines and consider their own community standards of care. Okay, Matt. Have you ever had smoked whitefish? Mm, I can't say that I have. This is an acquired I've had white fish. It's incredibly bland. Fish. You, okay. Do you like lox? I'm not a big lox person. I'm not either, really. Yeah. Ooh, it's on a spoon. It looks kind of like a onion dip, creamy yet chunky at the same time. <laughs> it's kind of like the stuff that um, you know you make when you when you get the Lipton's onion soup mix and you and you um, put the uh, what is it sour cream in there. 
except for instead of being little pieces of onions, it's mushy little fish stuff. <laughs> <laughs> this is bound to get stuck in my teeth, right? Uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. All right. All right. On a scale of one to ten, that's a solid uh, four. Oh, mm-hmm. no. I, I give it a nine. We're going to start a tradition in the beginning of each episode to just go in the news, random things we come up with. And I came up with some, so I'm hitting Matt with these blind. Uh Uh-oh. So here we go. First of all, it was announced last month that NYU Medical School would give free tuition to all their students, $55,018 free, which I think is amazing. And and this is a top medical school. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like a hallelujah moment for, for medicine because People come out with so much debt, Mm -hmm. and then they don't go into primary care or underserved areas because they have so much debt. They want to go into specialization. So I think this could be a game changer Mm -hmm. if other schools like Northwestern and Jefferson (laughs) and Hahnemann – oh, wait, Hahnemann's dead. But (laughs) – Long live on. Drexel um, will do this. What do you th- what do you think about this? Uh, you know, on the face of it, it certainly sounds like a fantastic idea. You know, I I think the intention here is to probably skew more people into going into primary care because they don't have some of the really oppressive debt. I can only speak for myself, but my debt when I graduated from medical school, and this was back in 1991 was $210,000. And that's the average debt. That is now right the now. average debt, like 195 according I think to a University of Michigan study. So it really is oppressive if you're trying to look broadly and and serve the masses in terms of being a generalist or a, you know uh, somebody who's a family practitioner, or internist or pediatrician. And this is of course what really attracts people into the into the realm of specialties largely. Gosh, they've got to pay their their loans back, you know, and they're still a physician, so it still carries kind of some of the weight of being intellectually challenged and helping people. But nonetheless, what we really need out on the streets these days are primary care physicians. But on the other hand, uh, hopefully it doesn't, hopefully it's responded to in the way that, that we hope, you know, uh, you know, if, if these folks come out and they're still being specialists, then, yeah. you know, so I think it's a great um, experiment. And, uh, and I think this is a wait and see. I mean, yeah. again, it almost sounds too good to be true. Yeah, right? I, don't, mm-hmm. I don't see it as solely just to get more generalists. It also mm-hmm. will just get more people, good people, to go into medicine. Now we need mm-hmm. to start to get in the other colleges to bring down regular tuition in right. colleges, right. which is also obscene. Instead of just giving a lot to certain people and such, mm-hmm. just bring it down for everybody. Yeah. Well, you have some familiarity with the Ivy League. Don't some of those schools now um, offer free tuition or... They do, yeah. and they do it basically. It's need based, so everybody can pay. Mm-hmm. It still should be cheaper. They yeah. have billions of dollars. Oh gosh, their tuition well. should be mm-hmm. cheaper for everybody. Mm-hmm. But uh, but no one wants to do that because if it looks like your tuition is lower, people think then the quality is lower. Right. It's a bizarre thing it's that a when really schools weird make dynamic. their tuition higher, like mm-hmm. GW, right. more people will apply. There's something psychological there. I'm sure there's a term for it, but I just don't know what it is. <laughs> so our, our, Anyways. Our second thing in the news is, brace for it, mm-hmm. quickly, mm-hmm. Bert and Ernie are gay. Really? It came out, Bert and Ernie are gay. At least that's uh, what the main writer for many years of the Bert and Ernie sketches said. He's gay, and mm-hmm. he kind of said he based it in a lot between him and his partner. Wow. And then the reaction of the world from mm-hmm. that announcement was, duh. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> we knew that. Uh-huh. Um, uh-huh. Although Sesame Street officially claims that both Bert and Ernie have no sexual orientation, that mm-hmm. they are just friends. Hmm. Does Sesame Street ever deal with, with romance? You know, beyond platonic? Yeah, I'm too far disconnected from oh, like I don't these. Know. But I'm no sure idea. you still ca- try to catch as many episodes no. <laughs> as you can. <laughs> you know, I was an electric company guy uh-huh. growing up. Remember, remember, I think we talked about before, do you remember Love of Chair? Uh, maybe. I remember, wasn't Morgan Freeman involved with them? I don't electric know. Electric company? Yeah, I think it was Morgan Freeman. I was a Zoom guy. I think guy. that was Shawshank. We're going Zoom, 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 okay. Zoom, okay. Zoom. I like that too. Mm-hmm. All yeah. right, so next thing is, and, and I think we both know this, that mm-hmm. the AAP, American Academy of Pediatrics, updated the child seat guidelines that basically every child should be backwards in their seat until they totally can't fit anymore. So until three or four years of age. Mm-hmm. It started out, the law said until one, and then we started saying until two if they can fit. And right. now it's even longer than that. So are you telling your patients that now? You know, I, mostly they're telling me. You know, they say, what do you think of this new guideline? And it's always been my contention, even with the last guideline, which was turn around until two, that there are just some children who are not going to peacefully ride in the car seat facing backwards and uh, and not be able to interact with their parents. Now, you know, there are mirrors and all that kind of stuff that some people will use. But, but to me, when you are flirting with safety based on a child's position in the car and their unwillingness to be in that position, then it gets a little, then it's a little bit dicey. And I think that's more of a case to case. In general, I tell people facing backwards is the way to go. 
but I've had parents tell me, listen, they'll, they'll unbuckle it. They'll get out of it. You know, they want to be facing forward and you know, what are you going to do about that? I totally agree. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we tell them what to do, but there's always going to be some exceptions, but I think the message we're going to give is stay backwards as long as possible. Three or four is a long time. Here's Mm -hmm. another one. Hospitals, this came, uh, it's another wow for me that seven huge hospital groups came together and they're going to start a new company to sell cheaper drugs to Mm. compete with pharma. And those are Catholic Health Initiatives, HCA Healthcare, Intermountain Healthcare, Mayo Clinic, Providence St. Joseph Health, SSM Health, and Trinity Health. Those are some big players. Those are more than... 500 hospitals in those players wow. who are going to get together since the government can't do this. They don't want to rock the pharmaceutical. Uh... Right. There's uh, there's too much money mm-hmm. in there. They don't want to try to have, I think, even Medicare mm-hmm. bargain on its right. own to get cheaper prices. So they're right. going to do it. I think this is great. I think it's great, too. I mean, it's about time. The fact that we pay exorbitant amounts in the U.S., not us necessarily, people who perhaps are in a situation where it's not as much of a burden, certainly, uh, you know, are, are, are people who are falling between the cracks are, are needing to pay exorbitant amount of money for medications that we're, we're asking them to take to improve their health is ridiculous. You know, just one more thing on this. You know, one of the lessons I've tried to teach my kids over the years is that when you are negotiating on any level, whether it be, you know, the cost of something at a yard sale or whatever, or, or a job or anything along that lines, you should deal from a position of strength. And these hospitals are dealing from a position of strength. There are so many patient lives involved here that they actually have the juice to hopefully be able to make a meaningful impact. So last grouping of uh, articles, one is uh, from a few weeks ago, uh, more teens are vaping marijuana than thought. A school-based survey, one in 11 middle school and high school students have smoked marijuana using electronic devices. And on top of that, a study in JAMA Pediatrics that adolescent electronic cigarette use is associated with subsequent marijuana use. Yeah, I was just listening to the radio the other day, and I happened to be in my daughter's car, and so I was flipping through her her preset stations. And my daughter is, you know, early 20s. And doesn't a commercial come on for Juul? And, of course, it lauds itself as being, this is an alternative to cigarettes so that you don't get cancer, and yada, yada, yada. And, yes, indeed, there's a significant amount of nicotine in, in these in these devices so that you'll still get the same feeling, you know, and, and so it was this really passive aggressive way to promote themselves as essentially a stimulant. Right. And mm-hmm. they're, and they're dancing because just a couple of weeks ago, the FDA finally, finally, finally got some religion and said, Hey, this is bad. This is an epidemic and made a big splash about you have 60 days and especially to jewel and a few other companies to fix this, or we're going to take action and maybe take you off the market, which Mm -hmm. at first flush, I was like, great, finally you got it. I did Mm -hmm. read a little bit later that, because I was really surprised because, not to be too political, but this administration doesn't like to enforce rules, doesn't Mm -hmm. like to tell people they can't do something, Mm -hmm. even when there's health reasons or climate reasons. So I was surprised, but then I read another article say the timing was totally to get publicity before the midterms, wow. to look like they're doing something because mm-hmm. people respond to let's not let let's make sure that kids don't become nicotine addicts. Right. So yeah. I'm glad they did it. I'm skeptical mm-hmm. why, but I mean uh, this is long overdue. It's, you know, it's just another insidious means by a big corporation to essentially addict you know younger generations to something that they're going to be able to profit from over the over the decades. And last thing, so we talked about people in the office saying something. So this week I had a mom said, and what do you think about all the metal in cereal? And it's one of those things where <laughs> in the office we kind of dance like, all right, what is she talking about? Right, where, and then, what, what blog did she read that and on? I'm kind mm-hmm. of a news hound, so I'm pretty, right, but, you but, are. I, but I actually miss this. So then I, mm-hmm. I, I left the room, like I have to leave for a second, and then I, <laughs> and then I Googled it, I'm like, oh, it's a thing. So basically there was a report in Consumer Reports last month that talked about food safety. A large amount of baby foods have cadmium, lead, and inorganic arsenic. Now, inorganic arsenic is the bad type of arsenic. Two-thirds had worrisome levels of at least one of these heavy metals, and 15 had a potential health risk to child. You can go to Consumer Reports and look this up. Have you heard about this? I've not, and I'm kind of embarrassed, you know, because I, you know, we should be on the forefront of this kind of stuff because this is a, these are the things that our our patients' parents are reading, and this sounds like it's not a fluff piece. No, you know? it's Consumer mm-hmm. Reports, and so I'll want to tell you the, the the ones they listed: Earth's Best Organic Chicken and Brown Rice, 
also their turkey red beans and brown rice and mm -hmm. then gerber's chicken and rice and turkey and rice and gerber's little meats with white turkey stew mm -hmm. and gerber's carrots pears and blackberries and my personal favorite <laughs> sprout organic foods and beech nuts classic sweet potatoes happy baby organic probiotic baby cereal and baby mum mum banana rice rust and there was just as much metals in the organic products yeah. as not organic so it's not like oh it's organic right it's much more pure that's sure. not true here sure we'll be right back after a quick word about our sponsors So we want to give a shout out once again to Campus Quilts. Turn your old t-shirts into a quilt. So both Rob and I have uh, have sung the praises of this company. And if indeed you decide to use this company, which we highly recommend, and you use the promo code pediatrician when you order or call, you will get 29% off. 29% off. 29% off. We just off. both ordered mm. new ones for kids in our lives. So yep. we're yep. really excited about it. And if you all behave yourselves, we may post a picture of ours <laughs> on our website. <laughs> People are really mm -hmm. excited about that with yeah. bated breath. Hey. All right. Anyway, once again, Campus Quilts, fantastic company, fantastic product, and we highly endorse CampusQuilts.com. We'll be right back. <laughs> Okay, we're back. The Hot Topics Conference always includes top five papers of the year, which may not be the best papers of the year, but they're papers that have things that speak to a few of the moderators. Please remember, as we cover what the speaker said, that any mistakes made in presenting information on these talks are our mistakes and not the mistakes of the speakers. They were all fantastic. I mean, well, except for maybe Rob, who presented a paper. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I sucked. All right, so first paper, Dr. Jeff Tonaszewski covered a really neat article from Pediatrics by Thompson et al. in October 2017 on breastfeeding. And as much of us know, the AAP recommends exclusive breastfeeding for the first six months of life, and breastfeeding should continue until a baby is at least 12 months of age. Now, currently, 82% of Moms start breastfeeding at birth, but only 55% are still breastfeeding by the time the baby is six months old. And often moms get discouraged that they can't get to at least that six-month mark with exclusive breastfeeding. Although, as we said before, their worth as a mother isn't based on whether they breastfeed or not. But this study showed that any, any breastfeeding, exclusive or inclusive, even if you also mixed it with formula sometimes, was protective against SIDS, infant death syndrome, even done for only two months. Any breastfeeding reduced the risk of SIDS by 50%, even if done by two months. So it's a nice study to quote, especially for working moms in our practices and for moms who don't particularly like to breastfeed. It lets them know they don't have to go the full six to 12 months in order to help their baby. Yeah, so that was a great article. But a second article reviewed by Dr. Shiva Kaladindi was on tonsillectomies. The AP's recommendation on tonsillectomy is to consider taking out the tonsils if a child has greater than seven episodes of pharyngitis or sore throat in a year or greater than five per year for two years or three a year for three years. So pharyngitis in this instance means either strep or a very red throat with cervical, which are neck, lymph nodes, or with exudate or pus on the tonsils. So this study from the Journal of the American Medical Association Head and Neck Surgery Journal from June of 2018 was done in Denmark and looked at 1.2 million kids over the span of 20 years. I mean, that astounded me, right? There is a good sample. <laughs> single payer, single yep. payer. Oh health my system. gosh, it's yeah. Easy to do. And with single payer health yeah. healthcare systems, for those of you who don't know, it's very easy to track results. So 1.2 million kids over the span of 20 years. So during that time, 60,000 of these kids had tonsillectomies or adenoidectomies or both by the time they were age nine years. The gist of the article was that tonsillectomies nearly tripled the rate of upper respiratory infections later in life and also increased the likelihood of allergies and other infectious diseases, but did decrease later pharyngitis. But you triple 
your um, your likelihood of having upper respiratory infections and also allergies and other and infectious diseases. So, wow, that's that's really a game it, changer. It is. Although, to mm-hmm. be fair, it's an observational study. It's it's mostly retrospect going back. Mm-hmm. So, it's one study. But I yes. think it has to give us some pause. And that's really the crux of it for us. In the past, on this podcast, we've discussed the fact that tonsillectomy is now considered the first line for FAPA. And this is a syndrome that consists of recurrent episodes of fever, sore throat, mouth sore, and the swelling of glands in the neck. Also, after a peritonsillar abscess, or essentially a a boil in the tonsil, or in the case of multiple antibiotic-resistant recurrent tonsillitis, those are also good indications for a tonsillectomy. And of course, there's always obstructive sleep apnea. Which I think is the number one thing that we see these days for getting your tonsils out. So this is just one study. I'm not sure that this alone will make me pause about recommending tonsillectomies in my patients who meet the criteria, but it does remind us that it's not a procedure to take lightly and that there can also be obvious complications, even death, as well as subtle long-term complications, as this paper points out. Stay tuned on this one, right? Right, right. Now, you know, I was thinking about this article about tonsillitis, and then last week, front page New York Times, which I read every day, and I hear you're going to start reading. I'm thinking about day. it. And so the article was all about the horrible toll that rheumatic fever, which is a complication of untreated strep throat, continues to have worldwide, with 33 million people having rheumatic heart disease in 2015 and over 300,000 deaths. Now, this disease has been almost completely wiped out in the United States and Western Europe, but not completely. So again, keep treating strep throats once you get a proper diagnosis with a culture of rapid strep and realize that strep throat can be a death sentence for many people in the third world. So the story was about a group of pretty amazing surgeons who kept going to Rwanda in Africa each year to do surgery to correct this. And they have very limited resources, these surgeons, and big waiting lists. So every year they have to go and pick out a certain number to get surgery. And if you're too healthy, they don't do the surgery. And if you're too sick and it's too late, they don't do the surgery. And it's just heartbreaking. They gave multiple examples of seeing kids and young adults who they went one year and they were too healthy. And then the next year when they came back, they were too sick and were going to die. So all of this can be prevented simply by giving penicillin with strep throat. Never take strep throat lightly. Yeah. And for those of you who are strep aficionados, please refer to our previous podcast on strep, which goes pretty deep in the weeds on strep. <laughs> more I than must you'd say. ever want more to know. Than, more than you, may, you may not want to open that box. I think yeah. it was strep ba la la la. <laughs> yeah. what it was exactly. All right. A third article was presented by Dr. Jim Stockman, and it was taken from his amazing Question of the Week series for the MOC, which means Maintenance of Certification Points, which always includes a medical pearl. This article concerned epidermolysis bullosa, or EB, which is a group of life-threatening skin conditions that are really rare. There are only about 500,000 cases in the world. Have you, have you ever seen a case, Rob? You know, actually, weirdly, I've seen it twice. One, wow. as a radiology resident over 30 years ago in D.C., it caused an atresia of the small test and duodenum, giving this double bubble sign on x-ray, which is the classic thing you see with Down Always syndrome. on the boards. Always on the boards. And we, we, I think we presented at the Air Force Institute of Pathology. And the second time was 20 years ago in practice when Dr. Pat um, referred me a, a child she had with EB that was pretty severe type. And I think I saw the baby once or twice, lots of lesions, and they died of infection. Wow. So it was, it was really, really sad. That's really tragic. Epidermolysis bullosa is a genetic condition in children which causes their skin to be very fragile and to blister easily, oftentimes with only the slightest type of injury or friction. This condition can also cause a slew of problems in tissues throughout the body, including the gut, but the biggest threat is infection. So there are different types of EB, from a milder version to a very severe version, which is lethal at birth. Even if these patients get through a lot of these infections, there's really a high risk of metastatic squamous cell carcinoma later on. So, you know, golly, as if having really painful skin isn't bad enough, then you get cancer. Dr. Stockman covered a really cool paper from the journal Nature, published in 2017, which detailed how investigators took a seven-year-old old boy with a type of EB called junctional type, who had blisters over 60% of his body, and they removed a four-centimeter square patch of his skin, so a centimeter, that's about two finger breadths uh, of his skin, that had not been affected by the EB, and then cultured it and grew his skin in the laboratory. Then they exposed these cultured skin cells to a virus which contained the normal gene he was missing, 
and the virus then inserted itself into his cultured cells, effectively fixing them, you know, really correcting that genetic defect by inserting the, the good gene that he was lacking. This autologous transgenic keratinocyte cultured skin was then grafted back onto the child to replace part of his defective skin, like they do with burn victims. After two years, the regenerated epidermis remained firmly adhered to the underlying dermis. This is absolutely fascinating. I mean, I know. So cool. I know. So the authors of this paper proposed that a bank of autologous modified epidermal stem cells be established for every patient diagnosed with a serious form of EB, and then it would be there in the future to treat skin lesions as they developed. Therefore, the goal would be to prevent infections and other complications and not just to repair damaged skin. So, with all the inherent fears about genetic engineering, here is a marvelous example of how it could revolutionize medicine. So in Dr. Stockman's additional medical pearl, he discussed new transition photochromic contact lenses will darken within the eye on their own. So contact lens wearers won't have to worry about having sunglasses for bright sun. So this product was just approved as of April of 2018. Currently over 40 million Americans wear contact lenses. So a person's contact lenses could essentially become built-in sunglasses automatically. Crazy, right? It is. Do, do you wear do you wear glasses so, or sunglasses? Or I don't wear any glasses, and I think I probably should. I'm getting close. I went to the Phillies game a couple of days ago. Really couldn't read the scoreboard that well anymore. <laughs> Although the way the Phillies ended the season, <laughs> there's nothing that you need. You know, I really didn't miss anything. No. Um, I am pretty ignorant about glasses. Yeah. I do know that you should never swim when you have contacts. I've had a couple of kids have really bad issues because mm. of that. But I don't know. Do you wear them? Uh, I, I'm supposed to. Uh, yeah, I, I could go on and on about breaking my glasses, losing my glasses, misplacing my glasses. That's why I don't want glasses. I'll yeah. Lose them. Uh, yeah, but I, I definitely at a point, actually my ophthalmologist in a timely fashion um, texted me the other day. Do your doctors text you to tell you that you're due for a visit? No. Yeah, yeah. It's actually, it's, it's, it's pretty nice. Yeah. You know? And then he texted me the next day, like, just to like, reiterate it, which some people would find annoying, but for my, like, forgetfulness, it was really helpful. But no, I have, uh, I've lost glasses in a variety of ways. I've dropped them into lakes as I was looking at the fish under a dock. <laughs> I have, uh, I, my most infamous one, I think, was when I, did I tell you my cell phone story where I killed my iPhone? when I was jumping in to, uh, you know, quote unquote, save my daughter's friend when we were at a swimming hole in Vermont. Oh yeah. I had oh. my, I had the coolest sunglasses and I swore I would never pay for another pair. They were, they were the, you know, one of those fancy dark, right. you know, kind of 1950s look thing. And of course they ended up in a Creek somewhere, I'm sure in, in, in Vermont. <laughs> so my rule has always been never pay more than 10 bucks for sunglasses. That's pretty good I'm rule. I'm going to lose a sunglasses. Yeah. I've broken that a couple of times. Pretty much, uh, that's the rule. Yeah. Well, regardless of how much you spend, you looking cool would always be a bit of a struggle. <laughs> <laughs> and not, uh, not in my Carson Wentz shirt. Not in your car. No, that, that's the I'm only. always cool. Uh, the darn two. Yeah. So Dr. Stockman did do one other article, which was actually about medical marijuana. That was great. But we're going to save that for an upcoming episode when we cover the third day of the meeting, which included a great talk on medical marijuana. The last article was by yours truly on a new technology called BillyCam, which can be used with a smartphone and a cheap cardboard color calibration card to estimate the need for phototherapy in jaundiced babies. Basically, it performs just as well as a transcutaneous bilirubin sensor that's used in the hospital. Now, the study was published in late 2017 in pediatrics, and it looked at this BillyCam as a screening device to tell us when to get a serum bilirubin, which is the gold standard. And again, help to decide whether we need to do that phototherapy. I started out with a vignette about a four-day-old baby coming to the office with a winter storm brewing. And you unwrap the baby. Everyone's happy and laughing. And all of a sudden, you notice the baby's really yellow. Now, I made up the vignette, but that's happened. That's happened oh, to all uh, of us. Gosh, time and time again. Late in the day, weather's bad. and Friday sudden, afternoon. Right, mm -hmm. Friday afternoon, you're like, ugh, mm -hmm. this kid's really yellow. In the vignette, I made the baby Asian on purpose because Asian babies have a higher risk of getting jaundice quicker, and it's well known sometimes they can be missed. In fact, my partner, we both know, Dr. J, would always quote saying, never trust a yellow Asian baby, which sounds kind of racist, but it's all about that we've all been burned. Well, and Dr. With... J is Chinese. And he's Chinese. Mm -hmm. I should have started out, he's Chinese, so he can get, get away with it maybe, mm -hmm. or it sounds better coming from him than me, yeah. but... I've been in that situation where I think, ah, this baby's yellow. Maybe right. it'll be in the mid to high teens, mm -hmm. which is an area, depending on their age, that usually you can treat at home or watch. Right. And then it comes back in the 
23, yeah. which basically it's needs very to tricky. be admitted. Very tricky. I do hate Jaunus. I don't like Billy Ruben. I've always not liked it in practice. And I had this little ictrometer back in the day, this little <laughs> plastic thing with different colors, yellow you're supposed to put on your skin. You're such a techie. Oh, I spent like 50 <laughs> bucks on this. And on this, this was little like 20 years ruler. ago. And it was totally worthless. <laughs> and again, when we're not sure, then we have to send the kid out into the elements to get a serum bilirubin in the hospital, which is not a pleasant experience to take your four-day-old, not to mention the risks of infection going to a hospital. In the hospital, we do have those transcutaneous ones I mentioned. Now, do you have one of those in your office, Matt? Oh, no. It's a lot of money. It's crazy money. I, crazy I don't even know money. how much it is, but last time we looked it up, we said, uh, oh, no. Not just mm-hmm. buying it, but each little sensor is a Absolutely. lot. So it's way too expensive. I think this Billy Cam sh- could be a game changer. And mm-hmm. the bottom line, the study, the Billy Cam worked just as well as transcutaneous Billy Room devices. If and when it gets released for clinical use, I really think it will revolutionize the treatment of hyperbilirubinemia in our offices and save lots of blood tests and adverse outcomes. It does require an internet connection, but still could be a big game changer also in low-income areas, especially in developing countries where cornicterus, which is the damage to the brain from high bilirubin, ranks fifth in mortality in newborns with over 75,000 deaths and another 100,000 newborns a year living with severe brain damage from the effects of high bilirubin. That's mind-boggling. Just another instance of something that is so easily preventable, you know, but that people just don't have access to. The big next question that I had, and I think the audience has, was, okay, when can we use this? And I reached out to the authors from uh, Washington State and Actually, the company making it was bought out by a huge, huge tech company that we're not allowed to mention, but you use it every day, Matt, and it has to go through a regulatory process before we can start using it in our office. And then at the end of the this talk, I couldn't resist mentioning our journey into the disappearing Billy Blankets in Delaware and the article that Matt and I were part of about this in our local newspaper and our frustration about not being able to get phototherapy blankets. And I'm happy to say that this seems to have worked, or at least getting a billy blanket is much easier now with new vendors and the insurance companies seem to be responsive and paying for it. Have you guys had yeah, any Yeah, a couple of my this? partners needed one on the weekends, and they both got them, and awesome. they were shocked. Fantastic. So, it may not have anything to do with us, but let's take credit, okay? Hey. And let, let, let's give some... We're always up for taking credit for things we have nothing to do let's with. Let's give a salute to the power of the press here. It's Darn not tootin'. fake news. Yeah, not fake news. We we'll don't do right, that here. We'll be right back. Mm-hmm. We're back with a quick plug again for Triage for Pediatrics, which is run by Julie Ortiz. As we've talked about before, they will take your messages any time of the day, overnight, whenever you want. If you're a pediatric caregiver, they will fax you or put it right to your EMR. Any messages that they get, they have the protocols that are nationally known. It will make your life sublime compared to Indeed. before you have them. And we, we can't say enough. It's changed our Reasonable, lives and practices. responsive, just stellar. Can't say enough. So Thank tri- you, Julie. Triage for Pediatrics, T-R-I-A-G-E, then the number four, then pediatrics, the number is 214-450-5030. You can email at jrts at triageforpediatrics.com and check out triagepediatrics.com. So next we're going to talk about one of the regular talks that was entitled Standing Up to Pots, P-O-T-S. And this was given by Dr. Mark DiSabella, a neurologist at DC Children's, who spoke on migraines at last year's conference. Dr. DiSabella, correct me if I'm wrong, Rob, but he heads up the headache clinic he at does. DC Children's. He does. Awesome. And, and he was a fabulous speaker. I use his pearls all the time. Yep, as do I now. 10 to 12 ounces of Gatorade at the onset of a migraine. You it betcha. works. It uh-huh. really works. Excellent. So we'll get to that in a second. But so POTS, P-O-T-S, or postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, are a set of symptoms with a variety of causes that can profoundly impact the quality of life of teenagers and young adults. The goal of treatment is to improve as many of the symptoms as possible with the least number of side effects. 
Dr. DiCibella really felt strongly that the best approach is a rehab type approach that's non-pharmacological. So this is a complicated disease, but really medications are only reserved for you know the very extreme cases here because they're really just not effective. The main symptoms are orthostatic intolerance for over a month, such as lightheadedness and palpitations with standing up, as well as tremulousness, generalized weakness, blurry vision, exercise intolerance, and fatigue. However, there's no consensus definition, but as spelled out in the name, postural orthostatic tachycardia, it's when the patient's heart rate increases by 35 to 40 beats per minute upon standing or is greater than 115 beats per minute while standing in the absence of orthostatic hypotension. So while the heart rate goes up when standing, the blood pressure does not go down. And this is what separates it from common syncope or common fainting spells, where the blood pressure does indeed go down when this happens. Right, our common vasodepressor yes. episodes. So in one large series, 75% of POTS patients were female, and they were mostly 15 to 25 years of age. Their onset was usually in the teen years, so we see them in pediatrics. And the most common symptoms were chronic pain in 80%, dizziness 74%, chronic headache 69%, fatigue 65%, abdominal pain 39%, and on from there. The symptoms always worsened in the upright position, and the thought is it's a combination of decreased blood volume and increased adrenergic stimulation, kind of like too much adrenaline when standing. And there's a sort of autonomic neuropathy with damage to the nerves, especially affecting the nerves in the veins and the legs and the intestine. So the blood pools there in the legs and intestines instead of being pushed back to the heart and brain. That's why many of these patients can get this bluish mottled look in their lower legs, along with brain and GI symptoms. There's also an element of deconditioning in these patients with poor exercise tolerance. Lastly, there is anxiety and hypervigilance and increased body sensations. But his main point was try to minimize the workup of suspected POTS. Get a good history and physical, perhaps get an EKG, perhaps a screening blood count, metabolic panel, some thyroid tests, and that's it. And that tilt tests are of a pretty poor sensitivity and specificity and may perhaps only be helpful in select cases in a specialty setting, but routinely tilt tests are not indicated. Now, Matt, do you order tilt tests in your office? Nope. Never do. No. How about how about twenty years ago? When I first started practice, mm-hmm. it was the it was the vogue. Now, I didn't necessarily order them that much, but right. I made sure they got them when they went to specialists and people having fainting spells, they were feeling tired. Right. A lot of tilt tests. I never order them anymore. And I don't often see cardiologists order them anymore. Every once in a while when they feel like they're they're heading toward the end of their um, treatment options or diagnostic options, they'll say, Oh, and maybe we'll consider getting a tilt test. But I honestly haven't seen one ordered in years. So Dr. D. Sabella was kind enough to outline the specifics of how to screen for POTS on the exam. And here they are. So number one, get a baseline heart rate after the teen is lying down for at least 10 minutes. Then have them stand calmly in place for 10 minutes and get a heart rate and blood pressure every two minutes or continuously if you have a Dynamap. At the same time, encourage them to report symptoms throughout the entire time. If they feel like they're going to faint when they're standing, you can modify this screening part to have them sitting instead of standing. Have you done this at all in your office, man? I really have not done this whole protocol. It's labor-intensive, time-intensive. I usually leave it to the specialists. I do try to get what we call orthostatics. Yeah, I was going to ask if you got Blood pressure, standing, Mm -hmm. and laying down, and the pulses. What type of uh, separation time do you use between your lying, sitting, standing on your orthostatics? I'll usually say two minutes. I think classically, depending on the literature you read, it's anywhere from two minutes to five minutes. Right. We're we're such a rush in the office that I I think sometimes we don't wait long enough also. And let me ask you one other question. You said that you do these orthostatics. Do you do them, Matt, or does your nurse do them? Oh, no. You know, I I flippantly will say like, hey, can you grab some orthostatics for me? Like it's only going to take them about 15 seconds. Right, right. (laughs) Right in the middle of them pulling up a shot for another kid or something like, uh, sure. (laughs) And and I think we both talked about we give this shot and that shot. Actually, we don't give any shots. No. (laughs) The only shot I ever give is my wife's flu shot. And I got to tell you, about half it ends up leaking out of her arm. And she looks at me like, is this going to work? And I'm like, oh, yeah, Yeah. it always does that. It's supposed to. That's right. That that blood is, Half of it's supposed to leak. Yeah, it's supposed yeah. to bleed a lot. It's as good. long as your arm doesn't go numb. That's all good. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> so if you proceed with this type of an exam, you can tentatively diagnose POTS if all of the following are present. A sustained heart rate increase of over 40 beats per minute 
or an absolute heart rate greater than 115, orthostatic symptoms that increase with a rise in heart rate and then resolve when they lay down again, blood pressure that does not drop by more than 20 millimeters systolic or 10 millimeters diastolic when standing, and the patient has long-standing everyday symptoms. Now, Dr. DiCipella also then covered a really interesting study from pediatrics in 2015 showing a fascinating overlap between children and young adults diagnosed with functional pain disorders and children and young adults diagnosed with POTS. And it was striking that the frequency of symptoms of fatigue, sleep issues, dizziness, migraines, nausea, joint pains, GI problems were almost exactly the same for both of these groups. Yeah, it sure does sound similar, doesn't it? Rob, do you have many of these kids in your practice? I have a few. You don't forget them. No, you don't because you just feel like, you know, at first you're thinking to yourself, what can I do to help you? And then you're thinking to yourself, I don't know, maybe you're a little wacky. And then you're thinking to yourself, no, this really seems real you know and so you vacillate between being sympathetic to their their psychology and being sympathetic to what they're really truly feeling you right know? And, the uh-huh. other, and the other part is that sometimes they are wacky and it's real yes as, absolutely as dr mac uh Dr. McDermott used to say Crocs get sick. So some people who yeah. may have a little bit hypochondriacal in ways, mm-hmm. but they still get sick sometimes. That's right. It's, like, that's it's like the reverse of the boy who cried wolves, right? Wolf, right? You know, because when we st- think to ourselves, oh, yeah, this kid is just kind of having a tough time at school. That's why their tummy hurts. You know, that's when suddenly has somebody has something really bad because exactly. you ignored it. So, so part of our job is being able to continue to, with sincerity, address a patient's, you know, symptoms anew and not just blow them off because traditionally they've been a little kooky. Amen. Yeah. So maybe POTS is a marker for other functional disorders or deconditioning due to pain. Okay, but what about the treatment? It's a team approach, and this can't be emphasized enough, with physical therapy, occupational therapy, psychology, rehab doctors, and neurologists working to help the patient regain daily function without medication while addressing the stress. And to be honest with you, Rob, there aren't a lot of places that seem to do this well. You know, at least not in our area, which is really rife with hospitals. In fact, rife with children's hospitals. But these programs are really just starting to come to the fore now. It's being recognized. Functional type pain that our, that our patients experience, well, largely what is treated is how the child feels about themselves. So, so all of this starts with education and multidisciplinary pain management. By far the most important piece of the treatment is the exercise regimen and relaxation techniques. The best prescription for POTS is exercise, exercise, exercise. You really need what is essentially a drill drill sergeant to get the patient going and then desensitize them to discomfort. And this can be hard. Dr. DiCibella stressed that the bottom line of the aerobic desensitization was basically do what hurts the most. So this is this is really kind of antithetical when it comes when it comes to it, but it, it really is what works. And that's what is your motto in high school in the Pine Barrens, right? That's every day. <laughs> Those kids, Matt woke up, do what hurts the most. Do what hurts the most. Uh, I love that. What would have really hurt the most would be living in Long Island um, or, or being a Jets fan. You know, that, that really would have done great damage to my Okay, not going to agree with Long Island, but I, I do agree being a Jets fan is is painful. And, and did they mention the Levine Protocol? Yeah, so there's something called the Levine Protocol, which has exercise routines and which advances from recumbent or lying down exercise to semi-recumbent exercise, which you can imagine is kind of half sitting up, to upright conditioning. Again, the right physical therapy team is really crucial here. Another aspect of treatment involves increasing water and salt supplementation. The water intake should be 80 to 100 ounces a day, and that's that's mega. That's big stuff right there. That's what we mm-hmm. do with the migraine kids. I tell, Absolutely. Them, I tell the kids you probably won't get there, but that's mm-hmm. the goal. You should yeah. be peeing all the time. Absolutely, and if they need to remember another way, it's an ounce per pound per day, and that's up to 100 ounces, which is similar, really, like you said, to what we do with the kids with the migraines. The patient should also avoid caffeine, and as with many of the other types of conditions that are like this, sleep hygiene is also key and they should avoid naps. And speaking of sleep, though, lately in the office, we talked about taking history. Now, simply shorthand when I talk about sleep with the teens especially, I just ask them, what time do you get up on school days and what time do you get up on the weekends? And often that gap is three to four hours. I get up at 6.15 on the weekdays, and then I sleep until 10, 10.30, 11 on the weekends, and that's the problem. It shifts their whole sleep cycle. And then Monday morning, they get up at 6 a.m., 
It feels like 3 a.m. and they're jet lagged, dead boy walking or dead girl walking for the first few days of the week, which worsens everything. We see kids who say my migraines are worse, my anxiety, which comes out as nausea is worse. If there's one piece of advice that I can give uh, to teenagers, it's make your sleep consistent. I just had a teenager on Friday. Same deal. You know, he's fatigued. And we talked about what his sleep patterns were. And they were just god awful. But, you know, honestly, Rob, I would say... Nine out of the 10 teenagers you talk to, their sleep habits are atrocious. Awful. Mm -hmm. And I agree with you 100%. Now, I was talking about just regular every day. Try to, you can't spend a huge amount of time. These kind of kids with uh, chronic issues, you got to pick gotta, it apart. It's mm -hmm. a long time. You got to tell mm -hmm. your triage nurse, this is going to be a while, yeah. scheduled for a while, Absolutely. and you got to walk through the entire day. For sure. Uh, so, getting back to POTS treatment, these patients should have, as Matt said, regular meals, frequent snacks, especially high protein snacks at night, like a cliff bar before bed. Now, do you have Cliff Bars? You're, you're a hiker. Do you... Uh, you know what? I just started getting back into Cliff Bars because I considered them to be kind of candy-fied and I wanted to stay away from them. But I have found that you know when you really read the wrapper on Cliff Bars, there's nine grams of protein in every Cliff Bar. That is a nice protein punch. Uh, and if, so if I'm running late and I don't have my usual like four egg whites in the morning like I, like I like to have, I'll grab a Cliff Bar and a handful of almonds and it's off to the races. And it still really is a, is a very um, impactful kind of snack. Or yeah, I remember meal. a while mm -hmm. ago, I grabbed a lot of Luna bars. Mm -hmm. I was eating Luna bars. And then someone says, those are only for girls. <laughs> <laughs> and you let that sway you, did it? I, I, uh -huh. I, I don't know. I don't know if that's true. It's, it's like, funny. Like here we are, like 55 like, oh, year old dudes. Yeah. And we still like take that kind of, like, we're right. all, <laughs> <laughs> no. well, I, I, I'm not a girl. <laughs> like, I, don't, I don't see estrogen in the <laughs> list of ingredients for the Luna bar. But, but I um, bought the blue one. <laughs> so we talked about Gatorade for onset of headaches, mm -hmm. but um, he often will just have these kids drink cold Gatorade every morning when they wake up, again, like they do with acute uh, migraine. And uh, he also suggests, again, avoiding coffee and especially avoiding sugar substitutes. Uh, so what do you think about sugar substitutes, Matt? I know we talked about the fact that there's too much added sugar in our diets. Right. But I personally think it's better to have real sugar mm -hmm. than to be pumping all these sugar substitutes. What do you think? Well, I'm not right. a big fan. So right. yeah, we all eat too much sugar, or at least as a society, we eat too much sugar. But I'm not sure that substituting in something that's been you know mass produced in some lab is the answer to things. I completely agree. How about a little discipline? <laughs> <laughs> Which we all could use more of. All right. So cognitive behavioral therapy is also a huge part of POTS treatment. And this should be started right away. And Dr. DeSabella's opinion is to really, really try to avoid homeschooling these kids at all costs. These kids should really never miss school because of pain or dizziness. Of course, he's not talking about the kids who are already homeschooled in the first place, which is which is a you know a completely different group of kids. Right. I'm not going to tell those parents you need no, to start school. No, no. Hey, listen. You know, whatever one thinks about homeschooling, I think that you know in the in the proper situation, it's the proper thing. But for kids who actually are avoiding school, right, uh, because of these symptoms, uh, that that's not a good thing. Right. So, and a big part of therapy is focused on the parents in order to change their behavior in terms of how they respond to their child's discomfort. With these kids, it's recommended that the parents should never ask their child about their pain or their dizziness. Believe me, if they're in pain or they're uncomfortable, they'll volunteer. They'll tell you. Absolutely. Yep. So instead of asking, are you in pain? Are you dizzy? Are you in pain? Are you dizzy? Instead, simply be as positive as you can. Parents need to understand that the symptoms these children's ha children have are real, but that the POTS is not a life-threatening disease. Parents need to avoid things like status checks and instead focus on distracting their child and encourage them to take short breaks when they're needed and not allowing the pain or the dizziness to be an excuse to miss school. Have you had any of these kids, Rob, who just really wanted to stay home all the time? They weren't up to it, or their parents wanted them to stay home because they didn't feel like it, things would go well at school. Right, and we'll yeah. get we'll get to it, but that's where getting psychology involved early Absolutely. is a big issue. And also, we'll talk more when we talk about concussions, mm -hmm. about the golden ticket, that for some kids, maybe... Mm -hmm. If they didn't like school to begin with, this is right. the way not to go. We really want to avoid that. Yeah, it's a bit of a dance because you want to get psychology involved early here, but really the family is coming to you because they think that there is a there is a more significant medical problem. Right. And uh, and it's a bit of a dance. You know, this is where having a good relationship with families in your practice really really matters. Getting psychology involved doesn't mean it's not real. Exactly, it's, not in their head. it's real. So it's worth mentioning again that medications aren't routinely helpful. However, they do sometimes play a role. And so these medications include things like midrogen, peridostigmine, fluorinif, and beta blockers. I've had one kid still on fluorinif with POTS, but basically most get off the medication. 
or don't even start. There does seem to be a, a subset of kids who have antibodies against their acetylcholine receptors, and these kids seem to respond to steroids. This approach is rather experimental, and antibody tests can be run through the Mayo Clinic. This is just something to keep in mind, and hopefully more research on this will be forthcoming. I, I got to tell you, I'm not sure I quite understand this. I mean, what what is it, myasthenia gravis, where you have um, antibodies? That's to... one of the conditions. So yeah. it's just, you know, I just thought that was kind of a cool note. There's more we probably don't understand about the conditions than we do understand. So right. ma- maybe this is the beginning of... That's true to form in medicine, out though, right? What's mm-hmm. going on? Yep. Yeah, I think there's still so much that we don't understand. But anyway, okay, so what are the long term outcomes? In a series published in the Journal of Pediatrics in 2016 of 172 teenagers involved in that study, 10 years after the diagnosis of POTS, 86% considered themselves to have recovered totally or at least partially, with fatigue and brain fog being the symptoms that tended to hang around the longest. So, in conclusion, the keys to POTS treatment were. One, getting together a multidisciplinary team, teaching healthy habits of hydration, exercise, sleep, and nutrition. Two, maximizing activity and minimizing medications. Three, distracting and desensitization. Four, attending school daily. Five, and doing what hurts the most when you're in therapy, particularly physical therapy. The providers and parents need to be patient and encourage these teens. Okay, that's it for now, boys and girls, and hold on to your hats because next time we bring you the hot controversy debate, should kids play tackle football as well as concussion conundrums in kids? Matt, say goodnight. Good night, Rob. Good night, Moon. Productions. All rights reserved.